escape me very quickly. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. 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 Um, just some announcements. Well, let me start with this. Happy Fourth of July. Hopefully some of you are able to go out and enjoy the day either today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Some of us will be working tomorrow making sure that everything is taken care of. But hopefully that'll stave off work in a later holiday in the year, so that's what we're going for there. Um, this Wednesday night, and actually starting off with an overview this morning in the sermon, Mark will be uh, teaching on the state. Whose law? So that'll be interesting. So. Um, yeah, we're just going to leave it at that, and we'll let Mark do that. But the the overview of that study on Wednesday night says this, of all the social spheres, the state to which God grants the power of the sword for the punishment of evil and the preservation of the good has the greatest potential to go awry if it oversteps its authority. The civil magistrate must always remember his place under the sovereignty of God, otherwise havoc will ensue. Um, <laughs> this Saturday, uh, we have our next race for Orange Track Racing, registration at 9.30 with racing at 10 o'clock. And there, I don't have a, there's not a slide up here for this. This is like a advanced 76 day out announcement for you. But the next movie, because we had our movie night last night, and we saw Faith of Our Fathers, which was perfect for the weekend. Um, the next movie we will be seeing is called Tulsa. Now, this is not the Tulsa that was made in 1949. This was made just within the last couple of years. Uh, I think 2020 is the date on it. So, curious what it's about? Go out to Grace Street Church, click on Grace Street Cinema up in the right hand. I like to point. So I do that when I'm on the phones with customers. They have no idea I'm pointing at things. <laughs> click Grace Street Cinema. You can read a quick overview of what it is. There's a link to the Tulsa movie website, and there's also a video you can watch right there on our website as well. I think that was everything. We will have tickets for that in the coming uh, month or so. I got mine from last night, using it as a bookmark for this morning uh, for our call to worship, which uh, this is a great uh, passage for our call to worship this morning. Listen to what Matthew writes, and starting at verse 15 of chapter 22, and it'll be uh, verses 15 through 22. And this is all headed up, amazingly, says taxes for Caesar, and it can be taxes for any government, but hear the words of Matthew. He said, then the Pharisees met together to plot how to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. Well, that's nothing new. Let's see what else is in here. They sent some of their disciples along with the supporters of Herod to meet with him. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. You are impartial and don't play favorites. Now tell us what you think about this. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knew their evil motives. He says this. He says, you hypocrites. Why are you trying to trap me? Here, show me the coin used for the tax. And they handed him a Roman coin. And he asked, whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well, then he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. And in saying this, he amazed them and they went away. Funny how he always did that, isn't it? He always amazed them. And they always went away without anything else to say. Have you ever wished you could do that when you're talking to somebody? You could say something so amazing that they couldn't refute any of it, and they would just go away understanding what you said. <laughs> but now he's talking about this uh, government. And, and God did create government. And he puts people in power. Now, we see that those people don't always do what is best for the people. We can go all the way back and we can just open up 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, and 
any of the a number of the other books, and we can read about the kings of Israel. We can go back and we can pull out a history book of the presidents of the United States, and and we can go and we can pull up books about uh, kings and queens of all nations, <coughs> and we can see that they may have started off with the best of intentions, but they didn't always get it quite right. They always made potentially a mistake, but. Here in this passage, Jesus is telling us to give to the government what belongs to the government and to give to God what belongs to God. And I think that's the most important part because you know, for us as Christians, God is before anything else. Father, as we prepare to hear the message that Pastor Mark has been given by you for today, Father, we ask that we hear the words. Father, we, that we understand what you are telling us about government and laws and those things that are all man-made but the things that more importantly that you have given us and the laws you have given us and that you are ultimately in control and that no matter what happens good or bad it will all happen for your glory because you are in control father be with pastor mark this morning as he prepared as he has prepared this message and i know he's taken great care a great deal of time to do that. Let us hear it. Let it resonate with us so that we can go out having a better understanding of what you taught us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody's bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, ready to go today. What a beautiful day. I got out there, got the car washed this morning and everything, and got in here nice and early, and I was, I was just sitting down, and I said, you know, I want to read a verse in the Bible. It just popped into my head, so I flipped open the book of Colossians, and I was going down through, the, through Colossians, and I was reading what it was talking about when, when uh, Paul was in, in prison, and he writes his letter through Timothy, and, and I was, uh, when we were getting, I fixed Lori breakfast in bed this morning, biscuits and gravy and ah. scrambled eggs and <laughs> coffee and yeah. So I brought it into her and, and she had Dr. David Jeremiah on and he was going through Colossians. And then, so this verse kept popping in my head as I was driving over. And so I got here this morning, I was reading through it and I was going, and here's the message to the church and what you should do. And it really resonated, and I invite you, I'm not going to go through it this morning, I invite you to go into First Colossians then, and go through that, and read what he had to say. Uh, as he was sitting in prison, and it, he was ending, getting close to being the ending of his ministry on earth. But it's amazing to see what he writes while he is chained to a Roman officer, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, he is in chains, chained to a guard. And he still praises God through everything. He doesn't lose his faith. And I thought about that video that I talked to you guys about from Mercy Me last night. Um, and so we played that this morning in here right before uh, our time. and. I, I invite you to go in there and check that video out again yeah, because it really, really hits home about no matter what you go through, no matter how hard life seems to be, God is still right there by your side through everything. And that's kind of part of my message that I want to bring to you this morning again. So happy 4th of July, almost. <laughs> almost. We're almost there. Yeah. So this last week, and I, I shared some of this last night, is is I was having a discussion with one of our new techs that uh, just started, this was his first week with us, our company in Nashville. And uh, so we were talking about the, the uh, message that I was gonna be given this morning here and, and kind of going through some of the things. And you know, we were talking about the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights and, and what it was and what it wasn't. And, and I said, yeah, you know, we have the Constitution and and all these things, and he goes, well, it's all one thing, isn't it? I said, well, no. I said, it's not one thing. They were written at different times for different purposes by different people. 
So I went through that whole discussion with him, and, and he says, well, they never taught us any of that in school. And I said, well, I, I went through that 50 years ago in school, and I was just kind of quoting all these things out to him, and he was just, you know, well, how do you know this stuff? How do you remember this stuff? And I said, because it's important. You need to know these things. This is actually the rules that you have to live by, that you're governed by, in the world that you live in. And so I, we, we had some really nice long discussions. Great guy, uh, his name was Noah. And uh, you know, just, just a wonderful kid. But it got me to thinking how many people don't know why we celebrate the 4th of July. We celebrate the 4th of July because it's a time for fireworks. It's Independence Day. I said, Independence from what? And so we kind of start that. You may wonder, why do, we, why do we celebrate the 4th of July? What does it mean? Well, this day is incredibly significant in American history. It marks the day that the United States officially became its own nation. Enter in the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> The Declaration of Independence was adopted on July 4th in 1776, and thus, at that point in time, they declared America a sovereign nation, which means they stand on their own, and they are not, uh, they are not dictated to by any other authority other than what they wrote in here. I think that is, that is truly important. They declared themselves a sovereign nation from other nations, but they declared themselves a sovereign nation under God. Under God. So American citizens celebrate America's birthday with festivals and parades and fireworks, barbecues, sparklers, and all kinds of other fun activities. America declared its independence from Great Britain and in order to fully understand exactly what this means and why uh, Independence Day is significant and what happened to uh, them back in 17, 1776, we need to go back in history a little bit. See, before America was its own country, it was comprised of 13 colonies established under the King's rule of Britain. And they were escaping we had a bunch of expatriates that were seeking escape from religious persecution under the Church of uh, England at the time. And that prospect of that persecution rose up in these people and they wanted to get away from that Church of England and the edicts on how they could worship, when they could worship, what they could worship, and who they had to worship. And so they, they decided that they were going to uh, flee persecution in England. And first they went to the Netherlands. Now most people think they came right to the United States and set up a shop, but they did. They went to the Netherlands and ultimately to Plymouth Plantation in 1620. Then over the next 20 years, the people fleeing persecution from King Charles I settled most of New England area. The first colony was settled in Jamestown, Virginia in 1607, and European countries, especially Great Britain, continued to colonize America throughout the rest of the 17th century and into a good portion of the 18th century. So everybody thinks, well, they just came over, boom, came in and did their thing, but it didn't. Uh, you can't believe this. This next portion will probably shock some of you if you don't not familiar with it. So by 1775, we had an estimated 2.5 million settlers in those 13 colonies. So it wasn't just a, a ragtag group of people that came over. 2.5 million settlers in 13 colonies. New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Delaware, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. That was the beginning of the states. So we have to ask ourselves, well, what led the colonists to seek independence? Tensions started brewing when Great Britain began passing legislation that gave it more control within the colonies, especially 
when it came to taxation of the colonists. So the crown was in debt after the French and Indian War, so it started taxing the American colonies to increase their revenues. They had to have something to, to fund those war efforts and things. And the passage of the legislation like the Stamp Act in 1765, the Townsend Acts in 1767, the Tea Act of 1773, goes on and on and on, forced those colonists to pay more and more and more money to Great Britain. Even though, at that time, the colonies had no representation in Great Britain at all. So they had no say over anything of what they could do in the states. They had no say over, you know, hey, this is too much taxes to pay. They had no voice whatsoever. And this became known as taxation without representation. Now, if you go back into your mindsets and you think about the Boston Tea Party and things like that, it's because they had all of these confiscatory taxes, one on top of another, on top of another. And it was tough because these guys were still trying to build the colonies out. They were trying to build the lives for themselves. And here's the government taking everything they have and taking it and shipping it all, all the way back to Britain, leaving them very, very little to be able to build out the new world in. And so it quickly became a heated pillar in the foundation of the American Revolution. So we had the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party that further escalated those tensions between those British. At that point in time, they became occupiers. Occupiers. And then you had the American colonists. And those tensions exploded in 1775 in the Battle of Lexington and Concord. And it broke out in Massachusetts as the British forces attempted to confiscate all of the weapons that the colonists had. They were trying to take all of their guns away so that they had no way to defend themselves. And it was the first time that the colonial militias battled British troops. And so the American Revolutionary War began. So we're going to fast forward now up to 1776. The Continental Congress meet, meeting in Philadelphia, you had the colonies come together and they formed the first Continental Congress to have their voices heard. And so you had a gathering of these people together and a statesman named Richard Henry Lee proposed a motion for the colonies to declare independence to become their own sovereign nation. And a committee was formed to draft an official independence document, which became known as the Declaration of Independence. So on July 2nd of 1776, Lee's motion for independence was approved. Two days later, two days later, on July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was officially adopted and America became a free nation. This was the birth of our nation. Now, if you've never <coughs> read the Declaration of Independence, there's a copy on the back table back here. And in our discussions that I was having with Noah at the beginning of the week, he didn't know the difference between the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution of the United States. He didn't understand that they're not the same document and they were done for different purposes. So America continued to fight in the Revolutionary War and officially defeated Great Britain in September of 1783. So I bring this all up to point out a question. And that is... Picture. <laughs> the state, whose law? So as we come into our next Wednesday, uh, we're going to be going into tour number nine in... The Truth Project. And tour number nine is, what is the role in government? What is our role in government? Does the government have the right to regulate your life? What are our rights under the Constitution? We hear a lot about rights for free health care, rights to free education, but see, none of those things are actually rights in the Constitution that are set forth in the Constitution in the United States. They don't exist. People have 
trying to usurp the Constitution and insert what they want to fit their agenda. But see, that's not a right established in law under the Constitution. The United States Constitution is a federal-based system, meaning power is distributed between the national federal government and state local governments, and it becomes what is called our sphere of sovereignty. When we take a look at the sphere of sovereignty, as the nation was established under the Constitution of the United States and with the Declaration of Independence, we were one nation under God, and so God is this sphere. They had a nation based upon God because they knew how important God was. They came so that they could worship God freely and openly without the state, without the king imposing his will upon them and tell them what they can believe and how to believe. And so they established a nation under God where everything was under God, family, labor, state, church, God and man, all of our communities were underneath one sphere, one sphere. We look into the Constitution of the United States that set forth the scope of our government. Uh, now, although the Supremacy Clause states that the Constitution under that federal laws and the treaties are the supreme law of the land. And according to the Supreme Court, it is clear that the Constitution created a federal government of limited powers. Of limited powers. Remember what they just came out of. They just came out of this point where Great Britain and the, and the kingship under him, the monarchy, would impose taxes upon the people and more taxes and more taxes regardless of the people's ability to pay them. And they were confiscating the things that the people had without representation. So they wanted to establish a government and the Constitution of the United States is written so that we don't get back into that kind of situation again. And so the federal government had limited powers the Supreme Court has noted that every act enacted by Congress must be based on one or more of its powers enumerated in the Constitution. These limited powers are set forth into what is termed the enumerated powers, Article 1, uh, Section 8 of the Constitution. These enumerated powers include, among other things, the power to levy taxes, regulate commerce, establish a uniform law of naturalization, Establish federal courts, the subordinates to the Supreme Court. Establish and maintain a military and declare war. Those are the powers that the federal government has. Think about that. I want you to think about those items right now. <laughs> Not quite what we have today, is it? The First Amendment of the Constitution sets out our rights for our religious rights. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people to peacefully assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Should the government overstep their bounds, the people have the right to come out and call out the government and say, hey, this isn't right. They wanted that representation. They didn't want to have their lives dictated to them by a state authority without representation. And so the government had to be responsible to the people. Responsible to the people. Not the people responsible to the government. Amazing, huh? How do you like your civics lessons so far today? So they thought a way to keep wrongs that were done to them by King George III, who had established one religion and restrictions on who could meet when, and they knew the importance of having unrestricted access to worship God. So what did they do? What did they do? They wrote the founding documents of the nation, the basis by which all laws can be interpreted and written based upon a central core of God. 
God is in control of the entire sphere. So if we heard this correctly, the federal government has very limited powers, and it begs the question, how did our government get so big with tentacles reaching into every aspect of our lives? If you think about it today, the government is in everybody's pocket, everybody's business. Well, in short, lust for power. Lust for power. Agendas and overreach. You see, the government and the representatives were only meeting to be a part-time venture when they first started out. They were only supposed to meet for a couple of months a year just to come through and take care of the business of the day. And then they'd go back to their regular jobs. It was never meant to be a full-time career. It was never meant to be a full-time job position. But they kind of morphed it into that as they put on more control, more oversight, that hunger for power and everything else. Well, you kind of get the picture, right? So in 1863, we had the end of a war. And it was the end of the war. It was the war to abolish slavery. It was our civil war, fighting against ourselves. One side rising up and the other because they thought they were right. And they thought that they could hold on to what they had as far as their power. According to President Lincoln in his 1863 Gettysburg Address, he makes that point. That these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that the people government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. The government was established to be under God, and of the people, and by the people, and for the people. But see, throughout this past 150 years, we've set the course to do exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite. How did we get so far off track? Why? Why did this happen? We had a change in our fundamental beliefs, a change in our culture, and a change in our moral politics. So let's see what defines politics, shall we? It says here that politics is the science of government, that part of ethics, ethics, which consists in the regulation and government of a nation or state for the preservation of its safety, peace, and prosperity, comprehending the defense of its existence and rights against foreign control or conquest, the protection of its citizens in their rights, with the preservation and improvements of their morals. That comes from Webster's 1828 Dictionary. And it's in its basic form, politics is not a bad thing. But when greed and avarice come in, they creep in, it gets a very distorted and barely resembles what its intended form was supposed to be. It all becomes about power and control. And in that process, in that process, then it sets aside our guiding principles and instead focuses on how a group can maintain power. Then follow the money. Oh, the money. The issue is, the further politicians get into the quest for power, the further God gets pushed aside. When we take a look at the problems in our society today, and we take a look at where we started and where we are today, God has been pushed aside. Over the last 150 years, we've gone from that God-centric picture, that sphere, under God. And instead, we've converted it into something completely different. In short, we started moving from a God-centric society into a state-centric society in which God was replaced as our center of our lives, our centering, our Jehovah Jireh, God, our provider. He was moved out of that place to being Uncle Sam, our provider. Beginning with our numerous social programs, a welfare state has been established. 
It began a dependence on the state to provide for them. And as the politicians found more and more power in the dependence of the people, they had even more programs and more overreach in the government, growing it to exactly what the founding fathers of the country warned against in their opening statements. The politicians' hunger for power and control have subverted our moral society. They've abandoned the fundamentals of the country that it was founded upon, and in doing so, they have exchanged our personal freedom for votes, most of which are found in the minority fringe nowadays. The fringe may have been able to impose their will upon politicians to get what they want in exchange for a vote. And as they themselves grow in power, more and more agendas appear. By passing personal freedoms off, and imposing more and more confiscatory taxes to be able to fund all of those programs and all the overreach. Taking away the moral foundations the country was founded upon, replacing God in the process, and vilifying anyone who would dare to challenge them in any way. We call this the rise of the state. And the rise of the state, if we take a look at it, we had our sphere of sovereignty before, and God was in control. God was the head of all of our society, and we functioned very well, and it was a very balanced society. But when we remove God from the picture, when we take God out of the picture, then everything else becomes subject to the state. And as the state grows larger and larger, it pushes God completely out of the picture because the state has the means to garner vast wealth and power. It can also begin to think that it has ultimate authority over every other social sphere that we see here. Family, labor, community, God and man, the church itself. See, when this happens, the state will begin to see itself as a God with no boundaries and reject the idea of sphere sovereignty, bringing every other social sphere underneath its control. And if we look at our society today, we see that exact thing. We see the overreach programs of the government coming into every aspect of our lives. See, even as a church, we have to be very, very careful what we say and how we say it because they can remove things from us. They can take us out of existence very quickly. And they've done it in the past. So I have a question. How did we get here? How did the minority get so much power and so much influence? How can we as a godly people get back to having a moral society? How can we ever get back to getting God to the place in our society that will bring us back to the morals? that we want and that we need? It's a huge question. It's a really big question that Christians have been asking and searching the answers for for over 80 years. Over 80 years. Well, the Founding Fathers had this covered, this very scenario, when they laid out the Declaration of Independence in 1776. In Congress, July 4, 1776, the unanimous Declaration of Dependence of Declaration of the 13 States, United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold, <sighs> sorry, <laughs> I get pretty passionate about this one. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable 
that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted amongst men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes so destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its power in such form as to them shall she the most likely to affect their safety and happiness. They wrote this in 1776. This was their statement of why they had to leave a government form that was confiscatory, a government form that had overreach, a government form that went into every aspect of their daily lives. And that's exactly what they did. They formed the Constitution of the United States. And of course, it was easier when, the, uh, when there were only 13 colonies at the time, and in reality today, it'd be almost impossible for the populace to rise up and take over. But see, that's already being discussed by several different groups. They want to hold another Continental Congress, and they want to change the way our government is acting and reacting today. They want the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So when we read those words of independence, they were relying on the sovereignty of God as the foundation that would make it happen. They knew that God needed to be at the center of the plan or it surely would fail. God was the basis on which this great nation was founded. God was present everywhere from our founding documents to our currency. And yet here we are today facing an all-out assault on Christianity. An all-out assault on the sovereignty of God and really any form of worship. a very pretty picture of our state as a nation. But fear not. Fear not. We are still one nation under God. God is still sovereign. God is still sovereign. God is still on the throne. And ultimately, God still has the final say. The final say. Let's go back to that picture of the sphere of sovereignty. And in that sphere, God designed each social sphere for a particular purpose with unique laws, roles, and responsibilities. To fulfill that purpose, therefore, we have to live accordingly within that structure. We have to function within that structure that God has laid out. Not that man has laid out. Therefore, a pastor has the position of authority in the sphere of the church, but doesn't have any authority in the sphere of the state. There's a separation that God put between us. And this concept was originally developed by Abraham Kuyper in 1837. And that sphere has been a sovereign charge to fulfill that purpose that another sphere should not breach. An example of that breach was found, if we go into the Bible, we can go to 2 Chronicles 26, and in there we hear the story of Uzziah, King Uzziah. And he assumed authority in the sphere of the church. And God struck him down, gave him leprosy, because he overstepped the boundaries of his authority. Trust me, this Wednesday, this is one tour you don't want to miss. Wednesday, we're going to be taking a very deep dive into this subject. It's a very, very important subject because it touches every piece of everyone's lives. The question of sovereignty, sovereign authority, has been a question for men for over 2,000 years. Whose law? Whose law do you follow? Whose law reigns? When the Pharisees tried to trap Jesus, he gave them the perfect answer. Render under Caesar what is Caesar's, and render to God what is God's. It's a perfect answer. No matter how powerful the ones in authority think they are, God 
is in control. Always has been. Always will be. Keep the faith. Keep centered on God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you today with a prayer of thanksgiving for the freedoms that we enjoy. Lord God, thank you for over 200 years of freedom and protection and blessings in America. In your name and by your hand, this country was formed. Help us to retain that as the mainstay in our minds. Help us not to forget the blessings and opportunity you give us each and every day. Keep us ever mindful of the sacrifice of the many for all of us who live free today in our nation. We pray for the safety of all of our military and of our civil servants today. We pray for our leaders from the mayors to the president, that you would guide them to make wise and godly decisions, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and in honesty. Father, remind us to pray when we're tempted to complain. Remind us of our prosperity compared to many in the world. Remind us of our freedoms that we are not under fear of oppression as they are in other areas of the world. We lift up the people in Ukraine as they endure senseless continued violence and the fear of death each day because of the political aspirations of a few. Remind us to have faith in the face of fear, hope in the face of despair, love for each other in the face of hatred. Remind us to see our prayers as a tool of influence because you are that influence, Lord God. We pray for godly leaders and godly influence in our homes, in our churches, in our institutions, in our businesses, in our communities across our nation. Most of all, we thank you for your presence and your power for you are the source of all holiness, happiness, joy, in your gracious name we pray today. Amen. We talked about this a little bit last night. I learned the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, from a little cartoon every Saturday morning called Schoolhouse Rock. And uh, I couldn't help but look it up. I might just have to buy the DVD. It's got all, every episode that was on it. They ran all the way through 2002 from the early, from the mid 70s. So 1973 till then. It was a great way to learn, but it's also a great way to learn to come and listen to uh, a pastor give a message about what God has for us. It's so important, you know, as we think about, and especially the movie last night, we watched um, as two fathers laid down their lives for their country in the movie. Um, at one point, you, as they're sitting in the airplane fuselage, both with their gunshot wound, you're thinking, oh, maybe just Maybe they'll get out of that and something else will happen, but um, ultimately, no, it did not. And you'll have to watch the movie because I'm not going to give any more of that. But um, John talks about the privilege of giving one's life for another. And the thing is, is that I could give my life for any one of you or all of you, and it would not match what Jesus did for us. And that's why what we do on Sundays, every time that we gather by sharing in communion is so important because it is a reminder of Jesus' sacrifice. Matthew records it this way. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, "This, take this and eat, for this is my body. 
he goes on to record it this way. He says, and he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks for it to God. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And then they all sang a hymn before they departed. It is because of Jesus' sacrifice that you and I have the freedoms that we do, not just in Christ, not just for eternity with our Father in Heaven, but the freedoms that we have here in this country, right here, right now, to believe in God, to worship our Father in Heaven, and to celebrate that all day, every day. And we do that right now by taking the bread and the cup. Jesus' body broken for you. Take and eat. And his blood shed for you. Take and drink. Glorious Father, we thank you for what this meal represents and the freedom that we get through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Father, we also thank you for all the men and women that went before us that have given us the freedoms that we have in this great nation that you have provided us and allowed us to live in, that we do not have to live in fear as many do around the world. Father, as we celebrate this holiday, let us not just remember those freedoms, but the freedom that we get through your Son, Jesus Christ. to know and remember that whatever trial we are facing in this life, that Jesus died for all of us, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life with him. So it gave me great hope. So is there any anyone that would like prayer this morning? Mark? No. No. I'd like prayer for my dad. He's going through some health issues right now and okay. um, needs to be lifted up. So. Okay. Anybody else? Pray for the uh, families that have lost people over the week. More shootings, more car accidents I've seen in the news that mm -hmm. I'm sure their yes. families need some some support right now. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And we'll lift up Sarah too because she's going to go into labor Monday. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we lift up Harold to you this morning. We just thank you for his life and all that he has done for everyone. He has been such a great minister and um, just, you know, speaking to others about his trials in his life. Just comfort us, Lord Jesus. So comfort him now in his time and his trials that he is going through. Lift his spirits, lift his heart. And give him great peace, Lord God, that only you can give us. In Jesus' name. And I, I pray for all of the ones that have gone through great trials with shootings and accidents and all kinds of trauma, Lord God. We just lift up their families to you. Help them to reach out to you, Lord Jesus, so that they can be comforted by others and, and know your love for them. Help them to read their Bibles so that um, they can have that peace that passes all understanding. For there's a lot of evil in this world, Lord Jesus, and we are not exempt, none of us. But you are with us, and you will guide and protect us. You will watch over us through it all and help us to get through it each and every day. 
And we thank you, God, for that. And Father God, we lift up Sarah to you today. She'll be going to the hospital tomorrow to be induced to give birth. I pray you comfort her and Antony. Give her courage and strength for the day. Let this baby come quickly into this world. Let no weapon formed against them prosper. May her baby be healthy and strong, Father God, and let the joy be found in you as you guide her through the pain of childbirth. Thank you for the blessing and joy they are about to receive. And Father God, we thank you that you alone can comfort our hearts. You give us great joy, peace, and love through your word. I pray that all who hear and want to know you will open their Bibles, read your word, believe that your word is true, and know that all things that you will you will bear their burden along with them. For in this world, we will have many hardships, troubles, severe pain, and sadness. But you have overcome this world. Those who freely choose to believe in you and have that personal relationship with you will have everlasting life. You have written in Revelations 22:17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who hear say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. For that we praise and honor you today, Father God. Thank you for all things, great and small. This brings us to our end of our online portion of our service today, and we thank everyone for being here. We ask that you would have a blessed and safe 4th of July. Uh, don't let out fireworks with your hands. Um, you got to be safe and got to be smart about it as we do it. But we really want to revel in the freedoms that we are given, the freedoms from God, the freedoms that he has given us and that we enjoy each and every day. Let us go to God. Dear God, help us to live a life of faith that is devoted to you. We want to have a heart that pursues you before anything else. You said if we seek you with all our hearts, we will find you. Help us to keep our focus on you and your will. Align our will with yours. And help us to keep your commands. Lord, we want to live a life of obedience and faithfulness to you. Help us not to fall into temptation and sin. Forgive us for the times that we have stumbled. And thank you for your forgiveness and love for those same times that we've stumbled. We want to change our hearts and live by your way, Lord. You are merciful and we know that you will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. I pray that you would provide a way out for us whenever we face temptations. And the courage to turn away from it. And whenever temptation and sin knock, help us to focus instead on your goodness and your love so that we can resist them. Lord, we pray for strength whenever we face difficulties and times that seem to overwhelm us. Lord, we know that you are there for us each and every moment. And we lift up each and every burden and worry to you because we know that you are greater than anything that we might face. Remind us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthened us. That we may gain strength from doing things that bring you joy. We pray to live a life of discipline. Teach us how to be a good steward and guard the minutes and hours you've entrusted us with so that we can use our time wisely. We pray that the desires of our hearts will be aligned with yours so that we can shed our unhealthy habits. Thank you for being our strength, our protection, and our provider, Jehovah Jireh, God our provider. Lord Jesus, in your name we pray today. 